happy that Marco Simonovic from CERN accepted to tell us about some real cosmology that one can do with the <laughs> observation. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much, Merdad, for such a brilliant introduction. Uh, <clears throat> uh, so, so, yes, um, I guess that the idea here is uh, the organizers asked me to maybe do a, a small review of some of the recent progress, both in theory and in data analysis. And in a nutshell, really, it is something that is presented in this first slide, how to take uh, the galaxy surveys data, which measure the position of, of galaxies in 3D space, and then convert them to some cosmological parameters the same way we do it for the cosmic microwave background radiation. And um, uh, I will focus mainly on spectroscopic galaxy surveys. As, as I'm sure that you, many of you know, they're also photometric surveys. These are a bit different. Uh, but most of the things that I'm going to say will be about spectroscopic galaxy surveys. So um, here is the outline of this seminar. There will be roughly speaking three parts. At the beginning, I would like to give some little introduction and motivation for um, why do we do these spectroscopic galaxy surveys? Where are we currently with, with the data? What is upcoming? And um, why are we doing all that? And, then, I will, in the second part, I will review a bit some theoretical progress in describing the dynamics of large-scale structure, and finally, I'll show some applications to the data, and then prospects for, for basically things that are coming in the next couple of years, which may be of interest to many of you. So let us begin with this motivation and context. So uh, I think that it is, it is fair to say that most of the things that we know very precisely in cosmology comes from studying with small density fluctuations. Uh, Asim has already introduced some of these things. Um, for instance, um, from, from the cosmic microwave background radiation that, that we can observe on our past light cone, which is represented here with this red, um, red cone, um, we, can, we can look at the CMB, and as you know, many of the important discoveries in cosmology in the last uh, 20 years or so, such as uh, precise measurements and, and confirmation that dark matter exists, dark energy and inflation, all of these things um, were amazing and they had a huge impact uh, not only for cosmology but also uh, beyond cosmology for particle physics, string theory, etc. And already uh, like um, in, in, in uh, Wafa's talk you could he hear about some of these things. But the question is well, can we do even more than that or there is something else to be discovered? Uh, maybe more subtle, something that we missed in the CMB. And uh, like for that, we have to look elsewhere. And today I'm going to talk about galaxy surveys, a nearby universe, and how can they be used in, 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 by themselves or in combination with the CMB to improve our knowledge of cosmology. And so, um, just to remind you, this is also something that you have seen in uh, Sim's lectures, but uh, these spectroscopic galaxy surveys are essentially big surveys which, which scan the sky and then you're trying to measure positions in the sky and redshifts of typically millions of galaxies and produce these maps. So here is an example from a very old survey, actually, um, 20 years or so old, uh, where uh, roughly you can see something like order, of order 100,000 galaxies, and you can see this nice cosmic web. So the distribution of galaxies in space is not random. Uh, it forms this uh, nice cosmic web, and this is not a coincidence. In fact, um, this, these maps contain a lot of information that uh, can be used to, to deduce uh, cosmological parameters and test various models, as I'm going to show. And we have been very good in uh, producing these maps. Um, what I'm showing here is like some kind of history of these uh, efforts. And um, for, for five decades or so, we are sitting nicely on this exponential line where the size of the spectroscopic samples and roughly speaking, the observed volume of the universe is increasing by a factor of 10, more or less every 10 years. And with the upcoming uh, galaxy surveys, which are, current, which are currently operating, in fact, they will deliver the data uh, in a couple of years, such as DESI, and a little bit further uh, during this decade, Euclid, we are staying on this exponential line. And there is something very important that is happening around this time, and this is that the volumes that we are observing and the galaxy samples that we are going to have are going to be sufficiently large that we are going to start being competitive with information on cosmo cosmology again for the CMB. So this is a very important uh, point in time uh, because um, as we move on uh, 
in, in, in the, maybe for, for you, of course, you can already think about the next decade and the planned service in the future, they may even surpass the constraining power. So um, there, is a, there is a long prospect, uh, an important prospect for uh, further developments in this field. So uh, why are we making these big maps? Well, the science case is extremely broad. Uh, apart from many relevant questions in astrophysics, what concerns cosmology, I, I could roughly split into two different parts. So um, the first thing I would say is that, the, 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 that these galaxies, as I already mentioned, uh, are not distributed randomly. And very importantly, they remember the initial conditions. So on very small scales, of course, things are scrambled by the complicated nonlinear evolution. Like in this room, we don't remember very much about inflation, I guess. But on large scales, uh, this scrambling is not happening, really. So when we look at the, the, the density field of galaxies, the similar way in the, as in the CMD, we are really seeing the imprint of these quantum mechanical uh, uh, processes during inflation that uh, survive until the, the late universe. And for that reason, this galaxy surveys a very powerful probe of inflation, and it can answer, uh, I think, in a very uh, qualitative way, many of the questions that we still have and that we cannot answer with the CMD alone. And then second thing is that uh, you can think about, since, since the gravitational interactions are the only basically relevant forces on large scales, uh, and, and, and since, we, since we have some base model, which is lambda CDM, and we know how the different components then interact within lambda CDM, then uh, using gravity, we can basically explore if there are any extensions to lambda CDM. And since everything gravitates, then looking at distributions of galaxies is very good because it's a very sensitive probe simply because of a huge volume of the universe over which you're integrating um, of, of various extensions. For example, the most well-known and, and guaranteed signal is the sum of neutrino masses, and even though neutrino is a very light particle, which we cannot be difficult to measure in a laboratory, simply using the fact that we have such a huge volume of the observable universe, we can do it uh, from galaxy surveys remarkably. But also we can test many other scenarios um, along the similar lines. For example, we can ask whether there are other light relics, for example, in the dark sector, but still massive. Uh, you, you heard already about ultralight dark matter yesterday, and, and for example, that is another thing that galaxy surveys can test very precisely. There are also classical questions such as, is there any special curvature, which would again have very important implications for inflation if we detect any, uh, or for example, what is the nature of dark energy? Is it really cosmological constant or not? Um, and, and so on so, and so forth. And so I, I think that uh, here you can see some list of questions and we can discuss them if, if you want, but the bottom line is that the science case for this service is extremely broad, and there are really uh, ways to probe uh, like all epochs in the history of the universe, from inflation through early universe to, to, to the late universe today. So whatever, um, eventually, whatever uh, theoretical model you come up with, you will have to pass the constraints from this, from this data, and this is why uh, this is so, so important. Now, you, you have probably heard about all this questions before, and you may wonder whether the CMB is just good enough, because CMB can answer some of these questions to some extent. So why just not doing CMB is not good enough? Well, there are roughly speaking two, uh, two reasons. So the first reason is that in, in the CMB observations, even though we have a long way to go, and you will hear about it next week from Blake Shervin, uh, we are approaching the limit given simply by the number number of pixels that we can observe in the sky on a two-dimensional surface, uh, which, which basically limits our ability to measure cosmological parameters, okay? So we are approaching this limit, and, in the, in, and, and this limit, uh, and we already know that we cannot answer all of these questions simply using CMB. The second thing, which is maybe even more important, is that C the CMB analysis is fantastic when you want to study really the base Lambda CDA model. But if you make extensions, what you there are many important, many large degeneracies which appear, and then the constraining power of the CMB alone is not so great anymore. So here I'm showing two examples, which are not even some crazy extension of Lambda CDM. For example, on the left panel, you can see the very well known degeneracy uh, which, which appears if you allow curvature to be non zero. 
in the CMB analysis, and then you anyhow have to use some external data sets, such as the BAO, to break this degeneracy and, and do the measurements. And on the right, another important extension of Lambda CDM, where you allow neutrino masses to, to vary, uh, I will remind you that in the baseline Planck analysis, the sum of neutrino masses is fixed, even though we don't know it. So this is, I would say, even the realistic scenario that we always have to keep in mind. And in this realistic scenario, you can see that the neutrino masses, and for example, the Hubble parameter degenerate. And again, in order to get the best possible constraints, you already at this stage have to use some external data sets such as the BL. So um, the bottom line here really is that CMB, of course, was great to establish precision cosmology uh, and to, to really uh, establish lambda CDM as our baseline uh, cosmological model, but it is insufficient, uh, like in the future, uh, for for answering to, the, to, to some of these open questions that we have and exploring um, like extensions of lambda CDM. Um, the galaxy surveys are complementary probes, and they're becoming competitive, and and in combination, as I'm going to show, they're becoming even much more powerful than each one of them individually. And so these are all reasons why this, you're going to hear a lot about this thing in the years to come. And this is going to be, I think, the topic which will dominate the discussion in cosmology uh, for the, in the foreseeable future. But of course, like in order to use this data, the, one of the keys is to have a, a good and reliable theoretical framework to making predictions for how this galaxy, uh, galaxy maps are supposed to look like what are their statistical properties, and, and, and um, uh, then this, is, this of course, is, is needed in order to be able to extract the information that we are interested in. So for a given cosmological model and a given set of initial conditions, you have to be able to tell uh, how your galaxy density field is supposed to evolve, and then uh, you can compare it to the data and tell whether your cosmological model and your cosmological parameter make sense or not. So um, then this brings me to the second part of the talk in which I would like to say a few words about what is at the moment our leading uh, tool, maybe even the only tool that we have at our disposal to deal with this uh, data analysis related to uh, spectroscopic uh, galaxy surveys. And um, it is something that I seem briefly mentioned in his lectures it is perturbative approach to galaxy clustering. And um, of course, it has own, its own limitations, but also I think it has a lot of advantages. And let me go a bit now through this more technical part of the talk where I will show you some uh, basic uh, logic behind it and some basic um, results. And then we will, we will see how it works in practice. Now, I'm, I'm going to present this from, I, I, would, I would say, from, from, a, from a point of view of a physicist. Um, so basically focusing on things that we usually use in theoretical physics when we want to deal with some dynamical systems. In particular, we're going to study what is the, 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 the dynamics, what are the equations of motion, uh, how can we solve them perturbatively, etc. And I will briefly say a few words about some, um, I would say, let's say, let's say non-perturbative results based on symmetries and so on. And of course, this sounds very different from maybe a story that you would get from somebody who is more interested in astrophysics or, or questions related to astrophysics regarding um, galaxy clustering. Um, but I think that it's a, it's a useful point of view and you should know about it. And um, Okay, so let us, let us start, first of all, reviewing what are the main nonlinearities that we have, should keep in mind when we're trying to describe the, the nonlinear evolution um, and galaxy clustering. So, at the, very large, at the very high redshifts, I'm going to illustrate this in some, uh, using some simulation outputs. So at very high redshifts, the field is uh, nearly Gaussian and fluctuations are small. So uh, you're very close to the initial conditions and gravitational collapse didn't have time to happen and produce the nonlinear structure. Just a, just a reminder that our, our variables that we care, the degrees of freedom that we care about are this density contrast delta you can uh, study it in the, either in real space or you can do the Fourier transform and then, for example, define the power spectrum. At, at early times, of course, this will be just the linear power spectrum, the two-point function of Fourier modes. But also you can study the higher order n-point functions if you want in a, in a similar way. Um, 
But of course, as, as, as the universe evolves and you're coming to, to smaller redshifts, the gravitational collapse becomes significant and you start forming this um, complicated cosmic web where you have voids, filaments, large dark matter halos. And then the first question that you should ask basically is like, um, at which scales these nonlinearities become really very large? Basically, what are the typical scales where this density contrast, for example, becomes of order one? You can answer these questions looking at the, the, the variance of the density field, um, which is given here in this equation, just the integral of the power spectrum uh, up to some scale, so some smoothing scale uh, that you're interested in. And you can ask then varying this R, which you can think of some smoothing scale, like for which R's uh, I get that the variance of the density field becomes of order one. And at, at low redshifts, this scale happens to be of the order of a few megaparsecs. Now, this, whether this is good or bad, like uh, it's maybe a point of view and perspective. But I think that the useful thing is to compare this scale to the horizon scale, which is, of course, uh, much larger, and this means that you have a lot of, uh, if you want, independent pixels or Fourier modes, which are in the uh, linear or quasi not, not so nonlinear regime that you may have, hope to describe analytically. And this number of pixels is typically, even if you do a naive estimate, much larger than the number of pixels of the CMB. This is the reason why we believe that these galaxy surveys have higher potential in terms of uh, constraining power and uh, for cosmological parameters. Uh, now, the simple gravitational collapse, which is induced by tidal fields and over densities, et cetera, is in some sense a true nonlinearity. But there are also other types of uh, effects which um, are slightly different, and they require slightly different treatment, but they're very important. So let me also review this. So, uh, so apart from just the gravitational collapse, there are also large displacements. And Asim has shown uh, this Zeldovich approximation in which basically you get the whole cosmic web starting from a homogeneous initial conditions, from a homogeneous universe, and then really displacing particles. If you want to estimate, and this already is a good approximation, so the true nonlinearities are basically some kind of a combination of these displacements and really gravitational collapse, which would be the, the true nonlinear collapse in the, in the structure formation. And if you want to estimate the size of these displacements, you will see that the so-called velocity dispersion, which, is, which measures how big are these typical displacements, is such that the typical displacements are over 10 megaparsecs, 10, 15 megaparsecs in the late universe. And of course, these displacements, um, if these motions were random, would introduce like scrambling of, um, um, of, of uh, like uh, matter on, on scales of the order of 10, 15 megaparsecs, but they're not random. As, as you remember from the Zadovich approximation, they're very much correlated with initial conditions, and with, with initial over densities, and therefore they're computable. So this is why the true nonlinear scale where we hit the real problem is really the one from the previous slide, well, these displacements can be treated in perturbation theory or beyond, even non-perturbatively, as I'm going to show, and uh, their effects can be taken into account exactly and computed um, uh, for, what, for, for, for all purposes that we need it for. Now, of course, this is all, for, this is all what I said so far it was just about dark matter, but the reality is, is far more complicated than that. So first of all, we are not observing dark matter directly, we are rather observing only a discrete set of tracers, such as galaxies, and this set of tracers is not even a fair representation of the underlying, yes? There is a question about Sorry. what the LSS stands for. <laughs> so the, the LSS stands for large scale structure. I apologize, maybe I should have introduced that. Um, Yes, so, so uh, these tracers are, are, are discrete, so there will be some sampling noise uh, inevitably related to the fact that you're probing the underlying dark matter field with a finite number of points, but also this, uh, these tracers are biased. They're not, form forming, they're not forming uniformly in your dark matter field, but they're forming very special points where the over densities are very large. And so, um, this will have an important implications, for example, for the structure of, of the perturbative solution. 
Um, also, this galaxy formation process is very complicated. We don't even know all the details. If, if you, we, can, we can run some simulations, we can, even with hydro simulations, we have different guesses for how important or how large are different astrophysical phenomena when the galaxies form. But we, it's, I think it's fair to say that we don't really know all the details which are needed in order to make a clear, clear predictions for what we observe. However, we believe that this formation of galaxies is local in space. In other words, the way that galaxies form in some region of space doesn't influence how another galaxy forms across the universe. And that, that will be important uh, to keep in mind. And finally, there is yet another uh, level of complication which comes from the fact that we, have, um, we are observing things uh, in, in redshift space, or in other words, we are observing redshifts which we want to convert to distances this mapping, of course, as, as Asim already showed you, is non-trivial because it involves peculiar velocities. And um, therefore, we're going to in inevitably introduce some distortions in our maps. Um, and this, these are the famous distortions which lead to the anisotropic uh, two-point function. And so the way that we usually deal with this is that we, when we measure the two-point function of the power spectrum, we uh, expand it in multiples. Um, uh, like uh, in, in the angle of the line, line of sight in the Fourier mode K. And, and usually, since this de angular dependence is not very strong, it is sufficient to keep only the few um, lowest order multiples, such as the power spectrum monopole P0 or quadruple P2, etc. All right, so is there another question? Because I see two things in chat. Maybe not. Or, or it's just me. Okay. There is a thank you, Miss. Okay, okay, great. So, so I, I, I briefly reviewed these very complicated details. Um, and, and, and the question then is like, um, what should we do? How, how should we proceed? Because uh, it seems that, that things are, are very complex on small scales. We don't even understand the, the, the physics of galaxy formation. So what should we do next? So one direction, of course, and this is more, I think, the way that things are, were, were done historically, or maybe they're more intuitive from the point of view of an astrophysicist, because this is the way we discovered the universe, going from small scales and then successfully observing larger and larger um, structures, is to first understand all the details of these astrophysical processes and small scale things, and then make predictions for what happens for the behavior of our dynamical system on large scales. Okay, that would be one way of doing things, and, and there is nothing wrong with it, but you see it is very ambitious. It really requires you to really solve all the difficult things first, and then go on large scales and make predictions. But this is not what we uh, usually do in physics. Actually, uh, most of the time, we think in the opposite direction. And again, this is because in physics, we are discovering the universe in the opposite way. We are starting from some large macroscopic separations, and we are learning about new phenomena by going to smaller and smaller scales. And for example, think about things such as um, molecular interactions and then fluid description. Of course that you discover fluid first, even before you know that molecules exist, or you don't have to know the details of quarks and gluons and their interactions to do nuclear physics, and, and eventually you don't even have to know really string theory in order to uh, talk about standard model of elementary particles. So usually, we, this, this intuition that we can describe the world on large separations without knowing the details on small scales is formalized in this effective field theory approach. And it's a, it's a very successful way of thinking about things because it saves us from having to understand all the details at once to so describe the relevant phenomena on, on a certain range of scales. Okay. So, um, I think that the question then is like, can we do something along these lines for galaxies? Can we just try to describe what happens on large scales without having to know the details on small scales? And this is, is an important, I think, um, shift in the point of view, which, uh, which uh, uh, I think happened around 10 years ago. And um, in, in, this, 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 this approach is called the effective field theory of large scale structure. And the idea here really is to think uh, from a point of view, an observer who doesn't live in a small galaxy, and they're trying to understand all the details, but really to think about seeing the universe from the outside and, and, and thinking about this galaxy field that we see in the data 
uh, as some, some, sort, some sort of a strange material, which is made of baryons and dark matter, which are self-gravitating in the expanding universe, um, and, and then study this material in the same way as we would study some other material, like, uh, or, or some fluid, without knowing its microphysics. So the, micro, the, phys the microphysics are known, but what we know is that the only long-range force which is relevant to the problem is gravity, and then we know how to do the calculations in this uh, setup. And the formation of galaxies is local in space, so therefore all non-trivial interactions which involve baryons will be localized in space, and they cannot mediate the long-range forces that will spoil your, your predictions on large scales. And so um, this, is, this is a setup in which we do not have to know the, the details or the UV physics in this context, it would be some kind of struct, some really like galaxy formation physics, in order to describe the long wavelength fluctuations in this, in this uh, galaxy density field, okay? Now, like in any effective theory, uh, I, I would have to specify here what are the relevant degrees of freedom. Uh, in, in this case, it is really the galaxy over density field, delta G. The equations of motion, uh, if you look at details, would be fluid-like, but with many additional terms, in fact, which are non-trivial. And they, of course, include gravity, because it's a very, it is an important long-range force, which, uh, which basically shapes the whole uh, cosmic web. And what kind of terms you're allowed to write down in these equations of motion is then dictated by symmetries of the problem and the equivalence principle, et cetera. And there will be, uh, as usually happens in effective theories, two expansion parameters. One is going to be the, the, uh, the smallness of density fluctuations, so the variance of the density field will be one small parameter. So if you want to write down terms in the equations of motion with more um, powers of, of density field, they will be suppressed. And the second expansion parameter is going to be the derivative expansion. In other words, if you want to write down the equations of motion terms which have more derivatives, those are also going to be suppressed. And the scale which suppresses these derivatives is the nonlinear scale, basically the scale where the fluctuations become of order one. And so then where, how come that this description is so universal and, um, and uh, why it doesn't depend on the details of the microphysics or galaxy formation? Well, it does depend, but only through a set of numbers, a handful of numbers, which are multiplying these um, terms in the equations of motion, and these are called counter terms or like effective field theory parameters, et cetera, and there are only a few of them, and you don't have to know them. For each galaxy formation uh, uh, example, these, these terms will slightly change, but the point is that, um, uh, that, that the, the, the description of fluctuations will remain unchanged. The, fo the form of the long wavelength uh, like fluctuations that you can expect is always the same, only these coefficients change, and they capture all dependence on the UV physics. And so, as a consequence, on scale larger than the nonlinear scale, such description will be universal, and it will apply to any uh, galaxy formation processes or whatever you have on small scales that you don't know. And this is the power of this, this idea. Marco? So since everyone is quiet, I ask a question. Uh, why, why is the expansion parameter delta G and not delta dark matter? Yes, I'm being, I'm being sloppy. It is delta dark matter. Well, um, delta G and delta dark matter will be related only through the linear bias, which is the number of order one, and also I think that sometimes there will be, there will be other non-trivial things which I'm not writing here. For example, the size of the dark matter halos which, which galaxies form. So for bias tracers, there will be other scales in the problem with the Lagrangian size of the halo, et cetera. But yes, this can also be like the delta, delta dark matter, which is very close to delta G, I think, in terms of uh, numerically, it's just very similar. Sorry? Why don't you take the only uh, uh, Can uh, you uh, repeat the Yes, yeah, so the question is like, why am I mentioning only the linear bias, I guess? Of course, the, the things are nonlinear. I'm just mentioning linear bias as, as a proxy of the difference between, like, as a, as a rough estimate, like how different delta G is from delta matter. And this number will be roughly some number of order one. And so, um, like, of course, if you want to be very precise, you would have to do a more careful 
like an analysis. I'm here giving just a rough ideas about what are the scales in the problem. There is also a question in the chat uh, asking to clarify the notation K. Uh, K, meaning like... Uh, I only mm -hmm. see K nonlinear. So. so K, so K here is just a Fourier, um, uh, like uh, wave number, when you do a Fourier transform, and um, K is inversely proportional to the, to the length scale, right? So if you have large Ks, you're talking about small scales in real space and the other way around. And um, the K nonlinear, I think if you want, is like, like uh, roughly speaking defined as a scale where the density fluctuations of dark matter become of order one, okay? So it is not a strictly a strict definition, but it is of order of a few megaparsecs. So therefore, this K nonlinear that is in this slide is going to be roughly one over a few megaparsecs. So it would be like, say, something like point uh, 3.4, something like that, okay? All right, so... Um, let me maybe uh, be a bit more specific in one simple example that um, where you can co really convince yourself uh, that, that or, or, or at least you can construct some <laughs> equations of motion for this long wavelength degrees of freedom Starting, starting from the from the exact equations of motion that you would solve on the computer, and where you can really see the emergence of these um, additional terms in the equations of motion compared to what you usually have in mind, and and how this how this whole effective field theory works really, and this is the example of dark matter. So if you want to solve like dark matter on on, on the computer, what you would do is to write down the collisionless Boltzmann equation, of course, uh, with the gravitational interactions and then just evolve um, the, the, the positions and velocities of all particles, and this is what we do when we, when we run numerical, numerical simulations. And, and then we can ask ourselves, but since we, don't, we cannot solve analytically this Boltzmann equation, what is the next best thing that we can do? I told you that one idea is to really look only at the long wavelength degrees of freedom, and, and where the fluctuations are small, with the hope that maybe there you can apply some perturbation theory. So the first task then is to find uh, the, the, density, the, the, the equations of motion for these small fluctuations uh, on large scales. So in order to do that, you can separate uh, the, the fluctuations or, or fields in the Boltzmann equation into short wavelength and long wavelength degrees of freedom. And you can just average over the short wavelength degrees of freedom. So you can explicitly do this um, starting from the Boltzmann equation. And what you're going to find is that uh, you're going to end up with, with the equations of motion for delta and velocities shown here on the right-hand side, um, which resemble fluid uh, equations of motion. So this is something that I, I think Asim also showed in his lectures. And they, uh, they have the usual uh, like structure, except that now on the right-hand side, for example, of the Euler equation, you, you have some additional terms. These additional terms come uh, uh, from, from this procedure of averaging the short wearing degrees of freedom and then tell you how at leading order in delta and derivatives um, the distribution of galaxies react to some uh, short wavelength fluctuations, okay? Uh, this term, of course, has a free parameter in front of it and you cannot predict it from, from this description. You have to measure it in the data, yes. Uh, yeah, so the question is like, can this extra term be understood as, a, as an effect of multi-streaming? Because I cannot do perturbation theory there, and now I, I'm seeing some consequence of that fact. I think that the answer is yes. For the dark matter particles, really, this is the correct interpretation. The size, uh, it, it is a bit like, um, again, complicated. Because in some sense, um, yes. So, yes, you can, you can see it. Uh, I, I would say it's a more effect more has to do with the fact that you cannot, even if there was no multi-streaming, you'll be still in trouble because your density fluctuations will be so large when you hit the nonlinear scale that uh, you would not be able to use these equations anymore and you will have to supplement them with some 
nonlinear corrections. But but um, let me maybe maybe mention in fact that as I, as I promised, this this is supposed to be the unique long distance description of some self gravitating dark matter, whatever it is. So for example, if you're talking about dark matter particles, then indeed there is some there is some um, essentially effective mean free path for dark matter particles which are captured in dark matter halos, which is the typical size of the halos, which is a typical length scale where the multi-streaming becomes relevant. And indeed, this is a typical size of the nonlinear scale. But you can, for example, consider other uh, examples of dark matter. And yesterday we heard, for example, about the ultralight dark matter. And you saw that the equation of motion for the ultralight dark matter is not the full Boltzmann, collisionless Boltzmann equation, but actually something different. It looks really very much like a fluid equation with additional term, which is this um, quantum pressure term, where, which can be very small for large, uh, let's say, axial masses. And so there, you would, uh, you would have, a, naively, the ideal fluid equations of motion, but if you, if you would, again, do this coarse graining procedure, um, without multi-streaming, by the way, uh, but if you would do the coarse grain procedure and focus on the long wavelength fields, you will again come up with the same set of equations. So, so these this, uh, counterterms, they have contributions not only from the fact that there, are, there, are like, there is some mean free path, let me just finish one second, but also from the fact that you have a gravitational collapse and you form halos, no matter what they're made of. Yes? Yeah, so the cutoff scale is also a free Um, well, um, it is it is a free parameter, but uh, well, in some sense it, it is a free parameter. You can decide where to put the cutoff scale. But different cutoff scales are just going to lead to different values of this coefficient here, such that when you do the analysis, uh, like uh, and combine the two, there will be no sensitivity to this cutoff scale. And why does the uh, Erwin's procedure does affect the continuity equation? It does affect also continuity equation. I'm, I'm being, again, a bit sloppy because this would take too much time to explain things. But um, there is a way to, to think about continuity equation in terms of the momentum rather than the velocity, in which case delta and pi, the momentum, which would be like 1 plus delta times v, right, would be basically re linearly related. In that case, the, the average would be trivial. Um, and you can then like rewrite everything in terms of these variables and do the computation. So in, in principle, it affects. In, in, in general, whenever you have the product of two fields and you look at the long wavelength limit, this is not going to be the same as the, the product of, of two long fields, but there will be some derivative corrections, of course. And uh, this affects every, every term, all terms where you multiply fields in the same plane. So the question was whether this averaging oh, also affects the continuity equation. And there I was yesterday thinking, when I give a talk, I will for sure repeat all the questions. But <laughs> 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 it's always easier when you're in the audience. Now, I have another question. Yes, absolutely. Why this average, uh, what guarantees it that after performing the average, you can still take the Boltzmann hierarchy at the, at the um, you other moments of the well, uh, <laughs> I was about to. <laughs> so, so, so the question was, um, why are we guaranteed? So, so why this uh, like averaging procedure gu guarantees that they can truncate the Boltzmann hierarchy, and why am I not supposed to keep all the moments? Well, there will be. A, uh, let me let me first maybe also mention this that the collisionless. When, when I wrote here collisionless system, this already should make you very. And disturbed because the coll collisionless particles can never become a fluid formally. Imagine that you have a box with particles and which never collide with each other. I can give some uh, some strange initial, let's say, conditions where they just have velocities along the x-axis and they all move and bounce back and forth. Between. They will never become a fluid. So for things to be fluid, th there must be a mean-free path. And for the mean-free path to exist, the system must be collisional. And the Boltzmann hierarchy can be always truncated on scales larger than the mean free path. Okay? So now, why the dark matter, which is a collisionless system, behaves like a fluid? Well, there are several reasons, but the most important one is that in the finite age of the universe, the dark matter particles cannot move very far because they're very slow. So this provides effectively a mean free path. And moreover, they're all captured in the dark matter halos, which basically provide, in a sense, another source of the mean free path. Okay? 
And so in a similar way as, as a fluid, if you're working on scales larger than the typical size of the dark matter halos, which would be the mean free path uh, for this system, then you're, you're guaranteed that you can truncate the Boltzmann hierarchy. And in fact, all higher um, terms which would appear like uh, in, in the other equation will be suppressed by this nonlinear scale. So as you're approaching the nonlinear scale, you will start seeing that so many additional terms become important. And in, in some sense, you will not, your description breaks down. You will have to restore the full Boltzmann hierarchy. But those scales larger than the nonlinear scale, uh, using a fluid is a good approximation. Are there any other questions? Of course, I'm super late. It's already time to stop here, I guess. How much time do we have? About 30 minutes. 30 minutes, okay. So, um, again, Asim already mentioned some of these things, but you see these equations now are some uh, equations of motion for delta, which you can um, try to solve perturbatively, since we are talking about large scales where delta is supposed to be small, there is some sense in which the leading order uh, linear theory will be the, the leading provide the leading terms, and then this like nonlinear terms in the equations of motion will provide some corrections. You can compute uh, like these uh, these nonlinear corrections, and for instance, I think that one, even one of the exercises that you have as a homework was to derive this second order perturbation theory kernel, which which comes from these equations. Uh, of motion, and this is something which is very well known and people have been doing for, for a very long time. Um, and, and once you have, for example, this second order solution, which will have this form where you basically convolve two initial uh, Fourier modes with some uh, function F2, then you can start calculating the nonlinear corrections to the linear power spectrum, okay? So one such correction, for example, with a diagram, uh, or, or, or there'll be a term where you correlate two second order fields, and it is represented here with these little stick diagrams, where you can, should imagine that the time flows um, from bottom to up. We have two initial Fourier modes, let's say Q1 and Q2, which are convolved to produce the final Fourier mode K using this second order solution. And then you have another second order solution, and when you, when you, when you co correlate them, you will be doing some average over the initial conditions at the end of the day. And this average is represented by this little green um, uh, dotted lines, and each, each expectation value of the, of the initial condition is going to produce one linear power spectrum in a Gaussian field, as, as Asim uh, already explained. And when, you, when, when everything is done, the whole contribution from this so-called 2-2 diagram, because you're correlating two second order solutions, is going to be some expression written here. So P22 is going to be some integral over some linear power spectra weighted by some perturbation theory kernels, okay? We call these loop diagrams um, by analogy with quantum field theory loops. And in fact, they're very close in nature to what Marco was telling you about. These are some, uh, basic, this is really like calculation about, of, of, of the correlation functions, not scattering amplitudes. Um, now, the full one loop solution, so the full next to leading order result, uh, has an, another diagram. This is exactly the one, the two diagrams that Marco already showed. One, of course, comes from the fact that you're correlating two second order fields, which I just described in the previous slide, is this one. And then there are also the same order in perturbation theory. There are terms where you correlate linear uh, theory with a third order solution, and that would be this diagram, okay? And on top of this, you also have to add uh, the, the uh, correction coming from this additional term in the equations of motion proportional to these free coefficients. Uh, that we call the counter term. So the final answer for the, for the one loop power spectrum is something like this. And as you expect, and as you can see in this figure here, these loop corrections are very small on large scales. And then as you approach smaller scales, they become large, they become significant, okay? And the second thing is that uh, if you look at the form of the leading uh, UV dependence um, of, the, of the one loop uh, diagram, which is shown here, it has exactly the same momentum structure as the counter term. And this is, and this is not a, a coincidence. It, it, it has to be like that for consistency because um, whatever uh, terms you're, when you're in, when doing the loops, whatever sensitivity you have to the very small scales, which you don't trust and you cannot um, capture well by perturbation theory, is absorbed in this uh, free coefficient here, such as your theory makes sense on large scales, okay? 
And this will always happen at all orders in perturbation theory and for any observable. Now, when we talk about galaxies, things are, of course, much more complicated, and I will not go into the details, but the logic will remain the same. There will be additional source of nonlinearities coming from um, these Rezich space distortion mappings. There will be additional source of nonlinearities coming from this galaxy bias, which can be nonlinear, etc. But you will have more terms to worry about, but the logic will be always the same. You can compute next to leading order corrections, and for uh, if you do things consistently, there will be always a set of additional uh, counter terms to absorb all uh, UV dependence of this of this loop integrals. Okay, and this will this will this will keep happening, uh, like for any observable again for any endpoint function at any order in perturbation theory. So, are there any questions about this? So the question is like whether these results are in the power of k over k, k nonlinear. Um, not all of them. So uh, let me, again, the, good. So there's a good question. So, so there are two uh, expansion parameters. So, so for example, if you, if, you, if, you, if, you, if you look at these loop diagrams here, their sum uh, is such that basically the suppression power is the variance of the density field times p linear. So this is one parameter. However, the counter term has k square, you can think of it over k nonlinear squared, which becomes r squared. So, so there, there are two kinds of expansion. There is like expansion in k over k nonlinear, and there is expansion in terms of the variance of the density field. And for, for each linear power spectrum, you have to decide um, how these two different expansions uh, like look like. And perhaps sometimes you have to keep higher orders in one than the other, et cetera. But it's a numerical question. All right. So. Um, I wanted to, to mention also some of these, uh, some of these non-perturbative results. Okay, so far I talked about perturbation theory and how to do it for this like, complicated material that galaxies are. Um, and, 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 and then I, um, I explained some basic uh, logic behind this EFT approach. But there are also some exact results. Um, if, I will go very quickly through this. But if you want to discuss, I'm here the whole next week. And uh, anytime, please ask me. There are some exact results um, that, that like, um, are valid even in the nonlinear regime. I will not tell you how they are derived. But essentially, these results like, like relate uh, the, the, let's say, n plus 1 point function. Uh, and this can be also generalized where one of the momenta, let's say this Q, is much smaller than all the other case. This is the so-called so soft limit of the correlation function. And then on the right-hand side, you, you can relate it to just the endpoint function. Okay? These are the so-called consistency relations for large-case structure. And the important point here is that the right-hand side vanishes if you have single field inflation. This is a non-trivial statement, but it, it is true. Uh, if the equivalence principle holds, and what is going to be important for us, I will assume the first two points to be correct. And what, is, what will be important in the next couple of slides is that if there are no features in the endpoint correlation functions, okay? Only then the right-hand side vanishes, okay? Now, uh, so remember, this is a non-perturbative result now that I'm showing you. However, we do know that in our universe there is, there is a very prominent feature in the, in the power spectrum and also all other endpoint functions. And this, of course, is the BAO peak, right? So there is some excess probability to find two galaxies separated around 100 megaparsecs. And so um, if, 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 uh, this feature is very important because it contains a lot of cosmological information. And we, uh, we would like to understand uh, the shape of this feature as well as possible, okay? Now, if you look at the linear theory, this feature is rather sharp. But if you look at the, this feature in the, in the evolved galaxy density field, which is nonlinear, then the feature becomes um, much less prominent. And there is some kind of a broadening of the BAO peak. Okay? So why is this happening? Well, the reason is that there are these uh, like fluctuations. Again, the reason that these displacements that I mentioned as one of the important nonlinearities, because um, if these displacements come from the Fourier modes with wavelengths, here shown in purple, so from wavelengths, who have wavelengths which are shorter than the BAO scale, but longer than the width of the BAO peak, they're going to move particles in, in a way which is not coherent over the entire ring here, which is shown in this black uh, 
dark matter particles. And therefore, they're going to distort this ring, such that on average, when you compute a two-point function, you're going to find that the BO feature is broadened, okay? So why did I mention these soft theorems? Well, because they provide a very simple and, and uh, simple way to understand how to deal with this phenomenon of the broadening of the BO peak an analytically. And in particular, uh, since, since there is a feature in the two-point function, this means that um, when you look at the endpoint functions here, you cannot uh, do a Taylor expansion so that the whole thing vanishes if um, uh, Q omega is, um, sorry, is like um, basically approximately equal to one or larger. Um, and, and therefore, you're going to have some enhancement terms, which go like uh, k over q. So remember, the limit here is that q is much less than k. And you can identify really these pieces in the endpoint functions, which are, which are exact. They're given by this non-perturbative result, and they're working in the nonlinear regime. But they also um, can help you to identify which of these terms um, are, are actually, like, like, in other words, where the information about the BAO peak is uh, in terms of the higher order endpoint functions and also motivate uh, this so-called infrared summation, where you can basically resum the effects of these large displacements. And again, this, this can be done exactly, even, even uh, for, for galaxies. Uh, it's not only something which is perturbative for dark matter. And in, in such procedure, you will get uh, some formula like this, which some of you may have seen, some simple versions of it, uh, where you, you really have to, um, do perturbation theory in a, in, in a way that uh, you can compute to one loop, but then for, for, for the feature, you will have to do something a bit more complicated, and you will have to um, basically uh, co compute order by order in perturbation theory how it gets broadened, and whatever you don't put in your perturbative calculation, you have to resum exactly using these displacements. So this is this infrared summation. Uh, so, so this result is non-perturbative in the displacement fields. They are resumed exactly, but it is still perturbative in the density field. So th there is always the same expansion parameters as before. As a consequence, you have such, um, you have results like as shown here, where you can see the data points, are these uh, black dots, and, and, and you have, uh, for example, the linear theory, which is the solid black line, and you can see how well this one loop uh, infrared summation formula works, which is shown in this purple line. So it goes to the very precise data points very well. Okay? And again, this is an extremely important step because this BO feature is one of the main things that we are looking for in the galaxy uh, correlation functions, and it contains a lot of information about cosmology. All right, so, well, can to I conclude. Ask, uh, um, hello? Yeah. Can I ask you a question? Yeah. So what is the tilde on P? What does it mean, P tilde? Oh, I guess it's just infrared sum powers. I don't remember why there is a tilde, to be honest. I haven't even noticed. Yeah. So this is supposed to be, you see, like it is really supposed to be the power spectrum, which is um, where you do the one loop computation, as explained in the previous slides. Mm -hmm. But this is not enough when you have features. Features get distorted by these large displacements. However, these large displacements can be computed non-perturbatively, and this is done in this infrared summation. So you have to correct this wiggly part or, or feature part of the power spectrum with this funny formula in the second line, okay? And this is how it performs. I mean, if you don't understand all of these details, I think it's okay, I'm around, we can discuss if you're interested. But I just wanted to show this because it's a very important aspect of this nonlinear dynam dynamics. And without it, uh, all the things in the analysis that I'm going to show would not work. So the bottom line is that this is a very busy slide, so don't look at all the, all the formulas. The, I, I just wanted to show that really for what is needed in the real analysis, I can fit all the ingredients almost in a single slide. Of course, in ratio space, things are more complicated uh, like all these perturbation theory kernels will now depend also on the direction of the line of sight. Uh, you're going to have, as I said, uh, additional terms in, 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 in the perturbative kernels which have to do with these galaxy biases, which are, uh, in turn uh, depend on the microphysics of galaxy formation, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, the infrared summation in retrospace is more complicated. 
it depends also on the, on the line of sight and so on and so forth. But all the formulas are really written here and um, at the end of the day, uh, using these relatively simple equations, um, you come to the point where in order to make predictions at one loop, uh, you, you have to know the cosmological parameters, the standard set of cosmological parameters, and then there are, there are several nuances parameters which are not uh, predictable within effective theory and they have to be measured from the data. Those include bias parameters, the amplitude of the shot noise, and several counter terms. And um, of course, I, so far I just gave you some theoretical arguments and I showed some equations, but of course the question that you may ask is like how well does this work? Because at the end of the day, uh, I'm still doing some approximation, some perturbation theory, so how well does it work? And so, um, uh, like in order to, to, to test it, many, many, many things have been done in the literature, but let me show you only one example, which I find uh, like uh, curious. And this is the example uh, where we were given a very large volume of simulated data uh, prepared by Takahiro Nishimishi and Masahiro Takada. And this, is, this was the famous PT challenge in which uh, we didn't know cosmological parameters and we didn't know what kind of prescriptions they use to create a galaxy density field. It was an HOD involving, of course, also satellite centrals. This, of course, all is in energy space and it is designed to resemble the, the realistic data as, as we see it in the BOSS, but the volume of the simulations was 100 times larger than BOSS. So they're extremely large volume simulations. And as you can see on these plots, like the data points are so small that you can re really not see the error bars. In the residual plot, you can see that the error bars, for example, for the monopole in almost all K beans are sm like, uh, like smaller or equal to 0.1%, okay? So these are extremely a large sim simulation volumes, and then the challenge was that we are supposed to use this theoretical prediction to fit this data and recover cosmological parameters, and the question was like whether can we recover the correct cosmological parameters or not, okay? So on the right panel, you can see um, the results of this blind analysis, and um, a a a as you can tell, we are of course able to recover all cosmological parameters and bias parameters in an unbiased way. And the error bars are rather small, so all of these cosmological parameters are measured with roughly 1% precision. So this, I think, is an, is, an, is an important test because the deal was that even if we get it wrong, it has to go on archive. So then uh, it's, very, it's a very dangerous game to play, but um, uh, uh, I think that we did have some confidence that the results will be, will be correct. And uh, this means that we have enough precision in our population to do even much larger volumes than what is available today. And so therefore, it gives us confidence that we, when we analyze the current data, we are not making a theoretical mistake. What is this L in the cap in the, on the right hand? What is SN? Uh -huh, SN varied. Uh, there was a small misunderstanding because they, they, told, they gave us the data with the shot noise, it stands for the shot noise, it was subtracted already from the, from the data, but there was a little bit of a misunderstanding what do they subtract exactly. So at some point we reintroduced the, the shot noise but with the fiducial value of zero and just marginalized over this shot noise. Yeah. It's just the amplitude of a constant shot noise. Okay, so, so, and this really means that uh, now with this kind of uh, theory at hand, we are in some sense ent uh, entering like a, like a new era in cosmology. Um, the reason is that this theory has been turned into very efficient codes, which, which are extensions of standard Boltzmann codes. I, I'm giving here like um, uh, three of them with, with, uh, with, with, we can look at these papers for details. Uh, and so, so these codes are basically able to compute all this nonlinear evolution even faster than the linear codes compute the linear power spectrum. So they're very ef efficient. And this opens up a possibility to run MCMC analysis uh, in, the, in, the, in this, in this like, um, spectroscopic data. And, and in the same way as this was very interesting when it was done for the CMB, I think that this, of course, now is becoming very interesting for the large-scale structure as well, and there is a burst of activity where people are trying this and applying it to various examples, and I will show some of them. But I, I also want to say that it is very satisfying to have this 
if you want, unified description of the history of the density fluctuations in terms of uh, this uh, weakly coupled effective field theory, all the way from the bunch Davis vacuum when fluctuations are coming from, uh, through inflation, through the CMB, and all the way to the, to the redshift zero. So we have a, the, the, the entire evolution under control, and we can apply these effective field theory methods throughout the entire history of the universe to make predictions uh, in, in a way that is like, like it's calculable, the whole theory is weakly coupled, and we have it under control. I think it's a big, it's a big, um, uh, basically, if you want, it's a big step to really complete this, this program and, and get the, uh, the whole history of the universe covered. All right, so uh, how am I doing with the time? Ten more minutes? Is it okay? Yeah. All right. So now this was the part about the theory of large case. I, I tried to convince you that even though maybe you don't understand all the details and these formulas look a bit like uh, all over the place, uh, essentially, like we do have a very good understanding of all these details, and when we test in simulations, they, they perform very well. So how about applying it to the data? Okay, let's do this. So um, now, how do we apply this to the data? Well, this is very straightforward. There is nothing conceptually difficult here. So uh, what we do is to take the galaxy map like the one that I showed you at the very beginning, for both data, let's say. Then you can measure the power spectrum from this galaxy map. This galaxy catalog, this power spectrum will be anisotropic, and therefore it will have like uh, the power spectrum monopole, here shown in black dots, and, 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 the, and the quadrupole in blue dots, etc. And what you have to do then is to take your favorite cosmological model that you want to test, let's say lambda CDM, make predictions for all possible values of cosmological parameters within some reason, and then compare these predictions with this data. Okay, this is all that you have to do. This is called the full shape analysis, and it is very similar to what is done in the CMB. From the, from the shape of this uh, power spectrum, you can measure all cosmological parameters. And crucially, this does not rely on any input from the CMB or other data sets, okay? You can really take these maps and measure cosmological parameters without any additional input. This is very different from the standard uh, analysis that the, the collaborations were doing in the past, which, is, which would be like a, like a fixed shape or fixed template analysis, where you take the cosmological parameters from Planck, you, the best field cosmology of Planck, you fix the shape of the power, linear power spectrum, and the only thing that you vary when you compare to the data is really the amplitude. For example, this is how BOSS measures F sigma 8, okay? So this is, a, this is something that is less powerful because you're not allowing the shape of the linear power spectrum to vary in such analysis, and also you're relying on the external data sets. Well, here, you're doing everything consistently and um, not using any external data sets. So as, as, as I mentioned, the ingredients are very simple, and, and, and here you just have to follow basically the first lecture or second lecture, I forgot now, that you have seen about statistics. So of course you have to have the data. This is just the power spectrum monopole and quadrupole from the Bose Galaxy catalog. You have to have the theory, and this is what I described before. And then you need some likelihood. We are assuming a simple Gaussian likelihood for the power spectrum. So the chi-square is going to be just the theory, the data minus theory, C inverse data minus theory, so as simple as that. And this C in this formula would be the covariance matrix. And the covariance matrix can be, uh, can be obtained in various ways. For example, you can use the MOG data for, for the BOSS survey to measure the covariance. Or you can even, in fact, that one is slightly off. To, uh, it turns out, or, or you can calculate it analytically, which turns out to be a better thing to do. Now, I could tell you, it's an interesting story, and I could tell you more about covariance, but I'm afraid that Merdad will not like it, so, <laughs> so I don't do this. So, 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 and finally, once you have your likelihood, if you want, you can also put some priors, let's say, saying that these EFT coefficients are some numbers of order one, which is a reasonable prior and calculate your posterior, okay? This posterior will be posterior for all cosmological parameters and nuisance parameters. And then, for example, you can marginalize over nuisance parameters to compute posterior only for cosmology, okay? This is, this is some, something that you have seen already in the lectures about statistics. 
not maybe in this particular example, but the logic is the same. And so here are the results. Um, so now let me comment about this result. So what is shown here on this plot is this triangle plot with all these parameters, the relevant param cosmological parameters. Um, and the red contours is what Planck measures. So the red contours is the best thing that we have at the moment from the CMB. And uh, let's say the, the blue contours, let's focus on the blue contours, are the ones that come from the BOSS analysis. All right? So as you can see, for some cosmological parameters, such as like, let's say, small omega CDM, or the, or the spectral index, clearly CMB is currently much better, okay? However, there are some parameters, such as the Hubble parameter or, or omega meter, which are measured in, in the BOSS data alone as well as in, as in the CMB, okay? And, and there are two important things here to keep in mind. First is that uh, this is a very important thing, to, this is an important plot to, to have because it shows you that if we assume lambda CDM cosmological model, the parameters that we infer from the CMB are consistent with the parameters that we infer from galaxy surveys, even though these two data samples are very different, they are taken at very different epochs in the history of the universe, and um, the systematics in two, two data sets is completely different, okay? So this agreement is rather impressive. And the second thing is that, as I said, that for some cosmological parameters, already the BOSS data is, is, is constraining enough to, um, to, to give us um, like a decent measurements comparable to those of the CMB. And in particular of the Hubble parameter, and in the light of the Hubble tension, this is an interesting result. All right. So are there any questions about the procedure? Yes, please. Uh, sorry, I didn't understand. Can you repeat? What priors are you using on the cosmological Okay, so the question is, like, which priors did we use on cosmological parameters? None. They're flat priors, like, let's say, omega meter is from zero to one or something like that. Okay. And uh, so you're, in the analysis, you're varying sigma A directly or, or AS? No, no, no. We are varying directly AS. AS. Yes. Okay. And, and uh, it's also flat on AS? Yes, it is flat on all, on all parameters, yes. There was another question? Yeah. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, typically when you, when you consider lobster cluster um, data, you have this redundancy between the, the Hubble parameter and, uh, and the uh, meta density, right? Yes. So how, how is it broken in this case? Okay, so the question is that when typically we consider the large case structure data, there is a strong degeneracy between Hubble and omega matter, and how is it broken here? I think that what you're talking about is this analysis of the BAO peak only. So this is, this, is, this is what I was saying in the previous slide. It's a very important difference. If you, if you have the BAO peak only, this corresponds to looking only at the wiggly part of the power spectrum. And if you have the BAO peak only, then um, you need some uh, sound horizon from the CMB in order to measure, let's say, Hubble parameter. If you don't use the sound horizon, there will be a very strong degeneracy between omega meter and Hubble, and you cannot infer this from the position of the B of peak only. However, since we are fitting here the full shape, then information on omega matter is not only in the BAO, but also in the equality scale, and also in the slope of the power spectrum in the mildly nonlinear regime. In the same way as the CMB can tell you what is omega matter, because you're using the full shape. This is the big difference. Yes, there was another question. Uh, the question is like, I didn't understand, disadvantages or advantages? Okay, so in fact, uh, the disadvantage is to use the covariance matrix from the MOX. The analytical covariance, so the question was like, is it better to use, uh, let's say, analytical or, or, or uh, covariance matrix from the, from the, from the MOX? Um, okay, so in practice, people always believe simulations more than they believe calculation. This is a sad mistake. So, um, like, um, you can, of course, use e either of the two. It doesn't matter, uh, as long as, 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 as you're sure that it is correct, okay? So, so you, the, re the, the problem with the mock data is that if the data vector is long, the covariance matrix is large, and in order to estimate the inverse of the covariance reliably, you really need a lot of simulations. And these are expensive, so people usually try to 
play this dangerous game where they are not running really maybe as many simulations as they would need. On the other hand, the analytical covariance is very difficult to compute. It's like uh, the only disadvantage, I mean, it will be correct, but the disadvantage is that it's a difficult to compute, and it's difficult to compute because there is a mask in all this problem. I mean, if you have a periodic box, no problem, then it's, it's not so, so, so hard. But usually there's here non-trivial masks, and then it's hard to do it. But I have to say that regarding covariance, that even if you use a simple Gaussian covariance, you will get the same answer. Uh, I think that the covariance is not so important. The, the exact form of the covariance is not so important. And the reason is that, um, while the data covariance, of course, in principle should impact things quite a lot, when you marginalize over Nusse's parameters, you're in a sense introducing a new additional contribution to the covariance, which is bigger than your data covariance, okay? I can, I can explain maybe later on a bit better. So, so really, it turns, in practice, it turns out that when you look at the posteriors from the, from the from, from, from let's say, MOX or Gaussian covariance or an analytic covariance, let's say, which includes non-trivial connected part of the tri spectrum, you will get the same answer. That's because the shot noise is also really high, right? This is, this is for two reasons. First of all, the shot noise is high, so you never enter the, the regime where, t where things get complicated. The only for are suppressed by the shot noise. There is, they're suppressed by the shot noise, but also there is, the, there is the contribution to the covariance, you can think of it as from coming from marginalization over Nusse's parameters. Because the one thing is the data covariance, the other thing is the covariance matrix for marginalized posterior for your cosmological parameters, okay? This is the two different things, and, and it's not clear which one uh, then dominates, okay? So maybe there are some samples in which, for example, neutral hydrogen comes to mind where the shot noise is very low, and this may be an issue, but for the, for the galaxy clustering, this is not a problem. You can, you can be relaxed much more about covariance matrix than about your theoretical model. Yeah. Can this approach be applied to photometrics? So the question is, like, can this approach be applied to the photometric surveys? I think that photometric surveys are much more difficult for perturbation theory because the way that things are done well, sorry, let me maybe say, say it in a different way. So, so just to the photometric survey in the sense that you have some uncertainty where your galaxy is, sure, you can apply it. But if you do lensing, then this is difficult for perturbation theory because in, in lensing, these observables that you're looking at uh, like somehow an inevitably mix uh, like um, large and small scales. As you said, perturbative calculation doesn't apply on small scales, to small scales, then this would be a problem. Well, in the galaxy clustering, there is a simple way to, to separate the two. Yeah. So it's more challenging, I think, for the metric. Okay. Uh, some, some questions yes. from the chat. Uh, so, oh, one is about the Hubble tension. Can you comment on the uh, values of redshifts that your survey is uh, measuring uh, or using compared to CMB and compared to supernova? Um, right. So I, I think that very often this Hubble tension is phrased as the tension between late universe or low redshift universe measurements and high redshift like uh, or early universe measurements. Well, in reality, this I don't think is a very useful distinction. So the redshift doesn't matter. Once you fix the cosmological, so, so the real distinction between supernovae and this type of measurements is whether you measure the Hubble directly, basically by definition, looking at uh, how fast different galaxies are moving away from you, or you're measuring it from the density fluctuations, basically fitting Hubble as one of the parameters in your cosmological model. So once you set the cosmological model, then the entire history of the universe is fixed. So there is no real distinction between late and early universe. Galaxies are just like the CMB, just nearby. Um, it doesn't, the redshift doesn't matter. You have the light cone, which intersects the evolution of all these fluctuations from, from, uh, from redshift infinity to redshift zero. And you're fitting these fluctuations. So, um, for example, like, like in this plot, omega matter, is it a late universe or early universe parameter? Well. You know, it is very important to set the transfer functions in the CMB, but at the same time, it's very important to estimate the distances to the galaxies in the late universe. So I don't know, it is both. 
Um, on the other hand, supernovae are measuring Hubble basically directly. They're trying to calibrate the luminosity of supernovae, and they're looking at the luminosity distance relation fitting for a single parameter, which is the Hubble parameter. So I think this is the real distinction. So this, you, you may be confused and think that this, uni, this, this thing, which overlaps with supernovae, but would be like the late universe measurement, but it is not. It is really the appropriate, you should say, it's an indirect measurement. We are fitting for the Hubble from studying the history of the density fluctuations throughout the entire history of the universe, while the other measurements are direct. Thank you. So there is another question about the loop computations in non-standard cosmologies. Uh, can it be done and can it be used as a way of discriminating those models? Um, it depends where the, what non-standard means. For example, if you modify early universe cosmology, but let's say people would like to do that, I'm going to show you some examples, then you can still use the exact same codes that are not affected. If you modify the late universe cosmology, you're introducing another long range force, which is not only gravity, you still can do loops, of course, and you can do the calculation, but you will have to change the equations of motion and recompute everything again from scratch. But in principle, the method always applies. Yeah. Is it all? Okay. All right, so of course, now I'm run, running out of time. And let me, in fact, finish. I think this is the, the last slide, or like basically next to last. I want to show you um, some of these non-standard examples exactly. And of course, like once, uh, once these uh, this, uh, this codes are out, I think that then like, you can do a lot of things with them. I'm showing only a few examples of things that have been done in the last uh, year or two. Um, so for instance, I haven't talked about the higher order endpoint functions, but all that I said about the two-point function applies also to the three-point function. You can also, also that one can be computed and compared to the data. And for example, you can see the constraints on the first constraints effect on uh, the so-called single field inflation, the type of non-Gaussianities which can arise in single field models, which is not local non-Gaussianity, but it's a bilateral or orthogonal, from the, from the large scale structure. So this has never been done before. Uh, the only constraints we had were from the CMB, and this is because we, we didn't have a reliable theory and the, the methods to apply, to, to compare the bi spectrum that we would compute to the data, okay? Then in the middle plot, you can see some analysis where you modify the early universe cosmology, you're adding a little bit of this early dark energy that you may have heard about as, as, a, as a way to solve the Hubble tension. And you can see that at the, like, like the addition of the BOSS data in this extended scenario is already very important. It basically makes the difference between whether like, your early dark energy uh, theory is a viable solution if you use only Planck data or BAO data, and whether it is not a viable solution if you use a full shape analysis. So it, it is already important at this stage, and if you do the forecast for what DESI will do, it will really shrink these error bars dramatically. This is a typical thing that always happens, that in these extended scenarios, these future galaxy servers will be extremely powerful, either alone or in a combination with the CMB. Then, for instance, if you, if you consider that, that the ultralight axions are a fraction of dark matter. Here we are talking about axion masses which are very light, as 10 to the minus 25 to 10 to the minus 30 electron volts. And as you saw yesterday, they cannot be the whole dark matter, but the fraction they can be, and this is interesting to look at. Then, for example, the red contours here in the, in the upper uh, left panel are showing you what kind of uh, constraints you can get from the CMB on this fraction of the axions of dark matter. If you combine this with galaxy clustering, you improve this by a factor of two. Already with BOSS, with DESI, it will, be, it will be much more significant. Or for instance, if you consider some light relics, which are uh, there in addition to neutrinos, again, for them, you either, people will use this BOSS, BOSS analysis to either provide the first ever constraints or tighten significantly the, the leading constraints that were present in the literature so far, before that. So you see, like, uh, this method is not only applicable to Lambda CDM. It can be really used as a generic tool to test uh, various extensions of Lambda CDM, which are all interesting. And, we, and, and, and with the new data that are coming, things are going to become even much, much, more be much, much better. All right, so let me finish with this final plot, which shows the forecasted power of, of a survey such as DESI or Euclid. Okay, you can basically apply the same 
method that, that I was talking about to make a prediction for what kind of cosmological constraints you will have in the future. And what, what the, the dashed, so this is, a, this is like, um, this, these are mock likelihoods, both from Planck and large scale structures, assuming that the neutrino, neutrino mass is like, I think, 0.1 electron volts, okay? So the dashed lines are Planck mock likelihood data, okay? The red solid uh, contours are what DESI power spectrum will give you, the same analysis that I was talking about for both. And the blue solid contours are combinations. So just take a look at, for example, Hubble and Omega CDM, how much we are going to improve in just a couple of years when DESI delivers the data, okay? This kind of improvement is quite impressive, even within the context of Lambda CDM. And for the extensions, uh, it, it is even much, much better. Okay, so I think that this is a very, uh, that it's, a, it's a very exciting thing because we will be really able to test very precisely, much more than what we have, at the, we can do at the moment, like both lambda CDM and perhaps find some discrepancy or deviation, or look for particular uh, imprints of other non cold dark matter things in our universe, such as, for example, ultralight axions or like. Um, these light but massive relics, or perhaps looking for some new long-range force in the dark sector, etc. In this, in these data that are coming. Okay, so I'm going to stop here. I'm sorry for being over time, and um, I will just say that, in this sense, really the galaxy clustering is the, is the new CMB, and you will really hear a lot about this in the years to come. And I think for you, it is very important to keep an eye on these things and these developments, both on the theory side and the data analysis side. Um, uh, because it will be an important uh, part of, 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 of um, uh, the activities in the field. Uh, I think that the perturbation theory is not perfect, but it can, it can really bring us very far, and it will be good enough, importantly, for the upcoming surveys. And I think that still there is a lot of room for improvements of this analysis, and also exploring uh, new um, physics, relevant new physics scenarios which can be constrained by galaxy clustering. So with these three remarks, I'll stop and take some questions. Uh, yes, uh, the question is if I'm here in the discussion. So absolutely, yes. Absolutely, yes. Anytime. <laughs> I'm very, I'm very easy to bribe, just a spritz or coffee, and I can like answer all your questions. <laughs> uh, you mentioned the EFT of uh, larger scale structure uh, is universal. Does this include the sound speed uh, parameter, I mean for fuzzy dark matter and uh, cold yes. dark matter? Yes, yes, yes. So, 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 um, the counter term, this, this uh, speed of sound, or, or the, the one loop counter term for the fuzzy, sorry, for the fuzzy dark matter, axi ultra light axion, or cold dark matter, would be actually very similar. It would be slightly different, maybe because they differ, of course, in terms of the microphysics. But as I said, one of the main contributions to this speed of sound really is the fact that you have gravitationally bound um, dark matter halos. And as long as those are not very different in different scenarios, the typical size of this halo provides really the typical estimate of the, how big is this counter term, okay? So, so in some sense, since gravity is universal, it doesn't care about what dark matter is, and it will form dark matter halos uh, in the same way. Also, these counter terms are to the same extent universal because they care also to, to a large extent about gravity only, okay? But yes, it, it is universal and in any Example, it, it would be a similar number, in fact. We have only used the BOSS data. So there are other galaxy surveys like SDSS and so on using those to... Um, 
so, so which others? Can you, can like the SDSS or something like that. There are a lot of Swiss stuff. Well, but the BOSS is, in a sense, an extension of SDSS. Okay. Even though they're not fully overlapping, BOSS is much bigger in volume. So it will dominate the error anyhow. Okay. Um, there, there are other, other data sets like quasars, for example, from eBOSS. But those are more difficult to analyze because they're very sparse. Um, the, the shortness is very high and the masses are very complicated. So I'm not sure it will add much to this analysis. And there are all these like galaxy lensing surveys. But for the reasons that, that I mentioned earlier, this perturbation theory is very hard to apply for the lensing. So I was talking about these spectroscopic surveys because I think that at the moment they're the leading probe from large scale structure side for most of the parameters. And this will remain true, I think, for the foreseeable future. Okay, if there is no more question, let's thank Marco again. Thank you.